presentations. We welcome back Dr. David Skanke to our Q&A panel session along with our new panel members. As a reminder, real-time questions to presenters can only be accommodated by those registered and logged into the Adobe Connect application. Please register to gain access. We'll answer questions relevant to the content presented in this session as time allows. If you have questions you'd like to be considered for inclusion in the April 9th Drug Master File and Drug Substance Question and Answer webinar following today's March 3 and tomorrow's March 4th workshop, please send them to DMF Workshop 2021 at fda.hhs.gov before March 19th. Please register for the webinar at fda.gov forward slash Cedar SBI webinar. If you haven't had a chance to enter your questions into the Q&A chat pod, please do so now. I see we have some questions coming in, and the first set of questions will be for Dr. Abelard. The facility which validates methods in the DMF, do they need to be in the ANDA 356H form? Uh, we may be having a technical uh, difficulty right there. We're going to go on to the next presenter. And the next uh, questions will go to Dr. Liu. What is meant by a regulatory starting material and how is it approved as such? Hi, this is Ray from SBIA. We're experiencing a little bit of technical difficulty. Uh, we're going to move uh, to our next <clears throat> panelist, and this the next few questions will be directed to Dr. Skanky. So are you suggesting that all the facilities in the DMF are to be listed in the 356H form, even if only a subset is used by the applicant referencing the DMF and only specify those used in the LOA? Please confirm. Yes, what we're suggesting is that the facilities that apply to the application and only those facilities be listed in the 356H form. Um, the issue comes up when there are facilities in the DMF that do not appear in the 356H form and there is no additional clarity as to why those facilities are not being listed. If the LOA doesn't specify that only a subset of the facilities from the DMF are applicable to the application, our assumption is that everything in the DMF, all the facilities are applicable. So it's incumbent on the uh, DMF holder and the applicant to provide that clarity if facilities that are in the DMF are being carved out for a specific application because they're just not used for that application. Thank you for responding to that question. We're going to move back to Dr. Abelard for the next few questions. If the drug substance manufacturer purchases non compendial impurity reference standard or other reference standards which are used for release and stability testing are and are qualified by the standard supplier or testing lab, does the reference standard supplier or testing lab need to be listed as a facility? Hi, thank you for that question. 
So no, typically reference standard suppliers or testing labs do not need to be listed as a facility. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question for Dr. Abelard. Testing facilities employed by non-routine analysis of the drug substance, should they be included in the ANDA 356H form? Hi, thanks for that question. Um, testing facilities that perform non-routine testing or non-commercial stability type testing do not need to be included in the 356H form in general. Thank you for responding to that question. And the final question for Dr. Abelard. If the DMF does not include micronization and that micronization is done by the ANDA holder, where should this information be mentioned? So thank you for that question also. So if the DMF does not include micronization, um, as in they're not performing it at all, um, then the micronization facility should be listed in the drug product application. So on the 356H form and in module three. Um, if it, if the DMF does perform micronization, but is not, it is not being utilized for particular drug application, we would expect that to be clarified in the LOA. Otherwise, we will assume that the micronization is being performed for that drug product application. And excuse me, we seem to be encountering some internet connection difficulties. Uh, Lisa, it seems that uh, Ray has dropped out of the room and Ray is trying to return, but perhaps uh, you could go ahead and take over on some of the questions, Lisa. Oh, it looks like Ray is back in the room. And Ray, if you were able to get that microphone, let's see if we've got you connected. We do have a connection here. Sorry for that momentary disconnection, but we are reconnected right now. And we're gonna to try to ask the next set of questions to Dr. Liu. First one, is a deep protection step, which involves a C-C, -C, I'm assuming that means carbon to carbon, or a C-X breakage, regarded as a chemical transformation step if the resulted unprotected intermediate is or is not isolated. Oh, thank you for that question. Uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, we do not consider non-isolated step as a chemical transformation step because generally it doesn't give the opportunities to purge out the impurities. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question will also go to Dr. Liu. How do we deal with in the scenario where the key starting material is prepared by mixing raw materials procured from a vendor at the same facility where the final drug substance is manufactured? Uh, once the uh, key studying material is manufactured in-house, uh, as long as it 
be accepted by the agency, uh, which means as long as it complies with all principles described in SEHQ 11 and its Q and A document, uh, is considered as the acceptable regulatory study material. Then it will be treated the same as any other acceptable regulatory study material by the agency. So we do not have any special requirement for this case. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. And the final question for Dr. Liu. Do we need to mention the ROS of a secondary DMF in section 3.2.S.2.2 or can we consider this as a starting material and include it in 3.2.S.2.3? Uh, thank you for this question. Uh, so for the manufacturing process uh, provi um, provided in the secondary DMF, it's okay you uh, list its route of synthesis in the section of 2.3, uh, which indicated for the regulatory study material. But please be aware that even in this case, we will evaluate whether uh, the product in the secondary DMF is actually as uh, regulatory study material or the intermediate. As I mentioned in my presentation, um, for a lot of cases, when the secondary DMF is referenced, the product in the secondary DMF is actually considered as an intermediate, even it is listed in the section 2.3 in the primary DMF. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. The next set of questions will go to Dr. Tawari. First question is, ICHQ11 states that a commercially available chemical is usually one that is sold as a commodity in a pre-existing non-pharmaceutical market in addition to its proposed use as starting material. What kind of data is expected to prove that a starting material is sold as a commercial commodity in a pre-existing non-pharmaceutical market? For example, is it sufficient to provide scientific literature describing the use of the respected starting material in non-pharmaceutical applications? Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, uh, you need to provide uh, literature uh, reference uh, to show that this starting material is available in non-pharmaceutical applications. Uh, please note that uh, other than that, you need to provide uh, for a specification and uh, uh, control strategy for the the commercial available compounds also. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question for you. In ICHQ 11 and the Q&A document, it is stated that all principles should be considered for choosing the drug substance starting materials. But are some principles more important than others? For example, if there is a critical manufacturing step before a starting material, it is, is it more important to include the critical manufacturing step to the GMP process even if afterwards the significant, significant structural fragment is no more in? This is just an example. There can be a combination of other principles as well. Thanks for the question. Uh, generally, uh, you should consider all the principle, uh, general principles uh, described in ICHQ 11 and uh, 
but uh, sometimes uh, it depends uh, whether uh, that uh, uh, starting material it does not have a structural fragment but you are starting from that point and there are other uh, ichq 11 principle applies apply then uh, it's okay i mean the, if there are enough uh, uh, drug substance steps in the manufacturing process uh, it's okay to uh, uh, designate that material as a starting material thank you thank you for responding to that question and one final question for dr tawari regarding the impact of the impurity for profile of the final drug substance is it sufficient to base the selection of the regulatory starting material on the fate and purge of organic impurities or is there also the need to assess the fate and purge of residual solvents and or inorganic impurities it's a good question uh, in, uh, the starting material selection should be based on uh, the impurity profile of the drug substance that impact uh, the drug substance. Uh, you, you have to assess uh, fate and purge of uh, uh, residual solvents and inorganic impurities. But based on that, uh, you, you don't make the selection of a starting material. Thanks. Thanks for responding to that question. Looks like we might have time for just one more question. And one second, I'm just waiting on my, uh, my document to reappear. And the last question will go to Dr. Skanky. If the starting material is a commodity in the pesticide industry, does it still qualify as a commodity starting material for the pharmaceutical industry? Yes, you could justify a, uh, a material from another industry that's a commodity item um, and use that justification to uh, uh, as your choice for a starting material. Um, as Anita said, you would just have to provide the proper, proper documentation uh, demonstrating that it does have a significant non-pharmaceutical uh, market. So uh, if it was from the pesticide industry, that would still be okay. Thank you for responding to that question. Well, that's the last question we have during this session. I want to give a huge thank you to our panelists for answering all the questions